Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Greetings, my name is Jeff Ross. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the Roswell United Methodist Church. Thanks for tuning in today and joining us in this time of worship. Our scripture this today is from Romans, the fourth chapter, verses 13 through 25. Hear these words from the Apostle Paul. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only those who are of the law, but also those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made your father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what God had promised. That is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for these words. Uh, we, thank, we give you thanks for the witness of Paul and the story of Abraham and the impact they can have on our lives. Use these words and, and uh, uh, my words today uh, to bring light and to bring hope uh, into our lives. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I wonder uh, if you picked up on this word righteousness. As we hear the story of Abraham and how Abraham's faith is a model for all of us and how Abraham's uh, uh, works at the stage th that all of us can, can follow, I wonder if you picked up on that word righteous. It's not a it's not a, a, a word that we use a lot, uh, but it's, it's easy to tell that it's something that Paul was fascinated with. It was something that uh, 
Paul uh, admired uh, the righteousness of Abraham. It sounded like something that Paul is attaining to uh, himself, striving for this righteousness. Uh, and if uh, Paul's not careful, it'll appear as if Paul is trying to do things in order to become righteous so that he can be held up in, in sort of a similar light as Abraham. That's always the temptation, right? That we do things in order to get some reward. And that's exactly the trap in which Paul's going to talk uh, 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 in these first four chapters of Romans. And, and that's what I want us to look at today. That's a, it's a big chunk of scripture, the first four chapters of Romans. Uh, but it, uh, the first two chapters uh, uh, are, are lead into the third chapter, which leads into this story that we just read uh, about Abraham. So I want to kind of help us uh, get a grasp on the whole thing and how uh, you and I are, are striving and seeking uh, for things ourselves um, and how this story that Paul is painting of Abraham and our faith uh, can give us hope and direction uh, as we read in the, 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 pa the passage uh, fr from Romans, against all hope, Abraham still believes. So uh, how can we have that kind of hope to persevere uh, in uh, the various places of our lives? And so this story connects uh, on different levels with folks. Again, this word righteous, uh, probably for church folks, it's a word that we're familiar with, whether we use it a lot, whether we sit around the table and go, gosh, I feel really righteous today. I'm, I'm not sure we'd wear a t-shirt that says, I'm, I'm super righteous. Um, it's probably not, not something we would do. For folks outside of the church, it's probably uh, not a, a word that we would use a lot at all in, in this sort of context. Uh, but Paul is writing to both uh, audiences. He's writing to the, the Christian and Jewish religious people of, of his day, but he's also writing to the Romans who uh, have no uh, history with Judaism or Christianity. Uh, and, and so what word would, uh, would you replace for righteous? What is it that you're striving or attaining or what model or person would you lift up? Uh, people today would probably say that they're striving for feeling worthy. Uh, or maybe measuring up, or being valued, or, f or finding value. Uh, people want to feel valuable themselves, like they have value, like we have value. Uh, but they also, we also want to be valued by others for the gifts, abilities, talents, uh, person that we are. And so we also worry and strive around uh, being successful. Uh, being happy, uh, being good enough, measuring up, uh, making something of our lives. And at different places and different times in our lives, maybe those are more important or one is more important. When we're young, we have certain aspirations and, and, and wonder what life's going to be like. As we get a little older, sometimes we reflect and wonder, did we make a difference? Did we do enough? Did, uh, did things work out? Uh, did we do the right things? Uh, did we say the right things? Did we live the right sort of way? I'm going to date myself a little bit here, but uh, the movie Papillon with Steve McQueen uh, is a, is a, has an interesting dialogue in the, in the middle of it. Steve McQueen is a career criminal. Uh, he's in jail. He goes to bed. He's, he has a dream. And in the dream, he goes before a judge. And the judge says that you have been condemned or, or you're found guilty of the greatest crime of all. And Steve McQueen asks, and what is that? And the judge says, a wasted life. Ow. I think that's, that's kind of a fear of a, a lot of us, that our, our life won't matter, that we missed opportunities, uh, that we uh, pursued the wrong things. And so how do we get and then stay on the right track? And that's kind of the discussion or the, the thought behind these first four chapters of Romans. Uh, in the first four chapters of Romans, Paul's going to use a, a, a few words or terms or ideas and, and uh, hold them in tension. The idea of the world uh, and, the, and faith and, and how they collide or, or seem similar. Uh, this idea of law and grace and this idea of slavery and freedom. 
uh, and how they all uh, w are woven together in uh, some sort of tapestry uh, is what Paul is, is going to try to help unravel. Uh, and Paul does this interesting thing of, of uh, contrasting and comparing the world and faith. He says on the one side uh, is the world, and he spends the first couple of chapters talking about people of the world, things they do, things they pursue. And they, they pursue these things with the same goal as the people of faith, uh, and they think that these things, uh, these things of the world, these pleasures, these temptations, these struggles, these battles will bring them hope and joy and peace and, and comfort. Uh, but he says they're misguided. But we, uh, we see that all around us, this human striving to attain wisdom, to think we can do it all ourselves, that we don't need anybody, that uh, we're self-sufficient. Uh, Paul says that's a, a dead end, but we pursue that in crazy ways. But he says on the other side, there's this life of faith. And um, uh, the, this life of faith doesn't always lead to the things we hope because we make the life of faith the goal, uh, and we're, we become slaves to it. Faith uh, starts, doesn't start with humanity, it starts with God and the belief that God breathed and created everything. Uh, but he says the result can be the same, that we are tempted and, and lured into slavery. He says that uh, the, we can become a slave to the things of the world uh, and get caught up in, in pursuing all these different uh, aspects of life to the point that uh, that, that uh, 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 obsession uh, destroys our life. But he says the same thing can happen with our faith. We can become so obsessed with rules and with uh, you have to do this and you can't do that. And uh, uh, Paul sees that rampant in the New Testament. And we see that still today that people get so focused on uh, this set of rules or this law or this idea or this verse of scripture or, or, or whatever uh, that, 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 that it robs us of the joy and the understanding of the whole and that uh, God's created a very diverse world. And so Abraham is lifted up uh, as a model because he didn't get trapped in that. He didn't become a slave to uh, trying to figure out all the things of the world, of getting ahead, of, of making the right decisions to please people, of uh, having the right things. Uh, but he, he followed God and he trusted in God, but not to the point of becoming slaves to the things of God. He didn't get so obsessed with rules and laws uh, that it robbed him of the joy uh, of life. And so Paul lifts him up as this uh, great father of humanity, uh, of how we are to live out our faith. And Paul is, is saying all this not to throw stones at anybody because uh, Paul knows better than anybody the trappings of the law. He spent the first uh, major part of his life as a, a Jewish leader who was obsessed with the law and he saw how it robbed his own life of, of, of joy and of hope and of uh, caring for people and doing the very things his faith had taught him to do. Paul only has to look at his own life to see how misguided things can become. So Paul is following this understanding of the world at the time, and it was based on Aristotle's thought that if we just teach people the right things, uh, then people will do uh, the right thing. Uh, and, uh, and Paul says, yeah, the, the problem is that we get sucked in by so many uh, different temptations and battles and struggles. It's, it's not that easy to, uh, to hear what we're supposed to do and then do it. Um, we, uh, we need to pay attention uh, to uh, the world around us and see the mess that it's in. And so in, in chapters one and two, Paul actually goes there. He actually talks about uh, in Rome, where people are involved in all kinds of things, uh, he talks about the danger of uh, how we can live lives that he describes as wretched, uh, and he points out how evil some of these things can be, how they lead us down a path uh, that, that doesn't get us where we want to be. And, and, and it's not like Abraham's path at all. And, and, and sometimes we kind of step away from that and, and we cover our ears. We don't want to hear that. We don't want to read those words. But sometimes that kind of thing needs to be said, doesn't it? Too often we hide from things. Too often we turn the other cheek. Too often we don't really want to know what's going on around us. We 
pretend that it doesn't exist. Well, Paul's not pretending, he's naming. Sometimes we need to do that. So, so Paul throws it out there. Uh, I'm, I'm, my, my wife Sherry and I are struggling with sort of a dilemma along those lines as well. We have a, a new puppy, uh, Stella, uh, is just a rescue dog. Uh, she's about 12 weeks old and we're, uh, it's been a long time since we've trained a puppy and uh, many of you know how difficult that can be. And so everything we're reading and watching and looking at uh, talks about training the puppy with positive rewards and treats uh, and, and, uh, and saying, good dog, good dog. A good Stella. Uh, and, uh, and that's supposed to work and eventually create the behavior that you want from the dog. Uh, sort of an old school is a little more heavy handed uh, than that. So we're trying this uh, approach of re reward and uh, positive behavior. Uh, but every once in a while, that, that old inclination pops up, doesn't it? Uh, so the other day, uh, Stella, I guess, was hungry. Uh, she was rooting around for something to eat, discovered the cat litter box uh, and uh, uh, took a snack out of it. I know that's gross, but the, the worst part was that she then bounded up into my lap and licked my face. Oh my gosh, that was the most horrible thing I'd ever smelled in my life. And here's Stella with a big smile on her face, just licking away. And, uh, and so my reaction to her wasn't one of positive reward uh, at all. And so, um, uh, Sometimes uh, we, we struggle with our actions. Sometimes uh, we, we struggle with what's the, the best way to uh, uh, talk about the things that are going on around us. And sometimes we just have to name it. Well, Paul's audience at this point is celebrating that the puppy's in trouble, uh, so to speak. Uh, the, Paul's audience, uh, most of them Jews and Christians, uh, are, are celebrating Paul's rant about the society at large. And, and you can almost hear them cheering in the background. Yay, Paul, go get them. Yeah, tell them what they need to know. We, we sort of cheer on that kind of behavior too when we watch the news or, or, or watch things happening around us. We love to see somebody get justice. We love to see people get what they deserve. And so Paul is berating uh, seemingly this, uh, uh, this culture around him in the Christian folks are saying yay, uh, but then Paul does this really interesting thing. He turns to the church in chapter 3, and he says to his church audience, very pastorally, very compassionately, yeah, but, but look at us. We, we do the same thing. Um, we make a mess out of life. Well, look at the church. Look at church leaders. Look at the lay folks in the church. We do the same thing. We can't seem to get out of our way. Uh, we, uh, we have the same sort of struggles and battles and, and temptations. Um, and, and we, we seem to still do that today. We can't seem to recognize uh, that uh, as we point fingers at and throw stones at uh, one group because of what they do, that we also have areas of our lives, uh, our country, our society, our nations, our world to clean up. Uh, whatever bad we're uh, claiming that other folks do, there's also uh, parts of our lives and our groups that we need to clean up. And so, it's in chapter 3, as Paul is talking to the church, that we find these words, which kind of are sort of directed at the church, there is no one righteous, not even one. Uh, we can't pretend that because we have the moniker of Christian or that we go to church that uh, we've got it all figured out. And, and Paul says that. He says, uh, because... Uh, oftentimes we take this Christian moniker uh, and, and uh, we use it as a, a weapon. So in chapter 3, verses 10 and, 11, well, really 10 through 18, we find Paul talking about the, the struggles and the battles, and he's just as honest. He's just talked about all of the things the world does, and he names a lot of it, uh, but he names a lot of what the church does to destroy the witness that we have. 
And it's, it's hard to hear. We recognize that we're a long way from home. It's no wonder that uh, Paul spent the first part of his life so obsessed with keeping the law. He was trying to justify himself, and that's what we do. We we get so passionate about uh, trying to keep this rule or that rule or memorize that verse or do this thing uh, that that becomes an obsession that leads to damage that we do in conversations and living out our life, trying to earn our salvation, just as the, the world seeks to earn uh, this feeling of hope and joy and goodness and peace uh, by pursuing all of these passions, uh, church folks do the same thing by trying to earn our salvation by doing these acts. Uh, and it's not that the acts are wrong or the things that we do are wrong, but sometimes we, we make them more important than the whole and we're blinded by what God is trying to do in our lives. So Paul says, no one is, is righteous, not even one. And so we're back to this righteousness. Uh, so where do we get that? Where do we attain these, uh, the, the value that we're looking for in life? And so as you listen to this today, maybe, maybe you're feeling a little burdened or hurt or discouraged about the attempts that you've tried to do the the right thing you've tried to do this or you've tried to uh uh find hope and joy through this thing or that thing and it's it's not working where do you feel the pressure in your life? Is it in school or your marriage or career or as a parent or uh, in some other way where you have struggled? Uh, you've uh, tried to do the right thing, but you wonder, have I done enough? Could I have done more? Could I have been better? Uh, where have I taken shortcuts? Uh, what can I do to fix that? And and at this point, we hear these words of Paul echo, none of us measure up, none of us, none of us do. And at that point, the temptation, and that's not Paul's intent, but the temptation is to begin to sort of wallow in that self-pity and that shame and, and to move in that direction so much that we begin to feel and, and believe ourselves to be failures or losers or, or no good. We hear this whisper, uh, I, I know we do, we all do, I feel the same whisper that I, I've been an awful husband or I've been an awful father or a miserable preacher or a terrible friend. I don't measure up in so many ways. And, and when we get to that point, when we're struggling in that kind of place, uh, we begin to cry out. We sink in despair. We, we stare at the wall and wonder how we can turn all this around. The harder we try, the further we get behind. And it's at, at this moment, right at this point where Satan has us just where he wants us. We're putty in his hands. We are a loathsome uh, uh, pile of pity and snot. We're on the verge of giving up, cashing it in, wallowing in our own despair. Uh, will we ever measure up to the good that we attain to? We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that would be tragic to, to stay in that space, but don't stop there because the passage continues. Uh, and uh, as we move through chapter three and four, we find Paul talking about Abraham and we hear uh, Max Licato, the great speaker and writer and author, uh, it says this about these verses. For 61 verses, we've sat with Paul in a darkened room as he described the fatality of sin. And that's what we've talked about, isn't it? Every candle is down to the wick. Every lamp is empty of oil. There is a hearth, but no wood. There is a lantern, but no flame. We have groped in every corner and found no light. Unable to even see our hand in front of our face, all we can do is stare in the darkness. But we're unaware that Paul has continued to write and continued to speak, and he's placed his hand on the latch. And just when we wonder if we can go on, if there's any light to be found, Paul throws open the shutters and announces, but God has a way. <laughs> 
And we read that in our scripture, didn't we? That it was God guiding and leading and directing Abraham. And the, and the righteousness credited to Abraham was, was not the good deeds that he did. That's not what we lift up. That's not what Paul is saying we attain to is just copy and work really hard to be just like Abraham. Uh, Abraham, the righteousness credited to Abraham can also be the same righteousness uh, to us in that we have faith against all hope Abraham believed he didn't try to do it himself he didn't try to just pull himself up by his own bootstraps and work harder he also didn't try to keep all of the rules and all of the laws of faith. Uh, in fact, if you read the story of Abraham in, in uh, uh, Genesis, you find Abraham makes as many mistakes as, as any of us. But what Abraham did is he believed, he trusted, he walked with God, and he tried to make the best of every situation. He tried to remember it wasn't his power that he needed to rely on, but it was God's. And he put his life and his family and everything in God's hands. And I, and I think that it was Abraham that Jesus was thinking about when he said in the Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God. And, it, and if you do that, if you put your focus just right there, not on keeping every rule and every law, but seek first the kingdom of God, God will honor that and everything else will fall into place. Let us pray. God, we struggle with measuring up. We struggle with success, with succeeding, with uh, being the best husband, being the best uh, employee, being the best student, uh, being the best at everything, of, of tackling a, a problem in a situation and, and doing it well. And, and we strive for that, really, and, and uh, that can be exhausting. And we ask you to help us, God, realize that, that when it comes to faith, and for living our life, we, we can't do that. All have sinned and fallen short of, of your glory. But we can put our trust in you. We can seek first you and your kingdom. We can put you above everything else and know that then all of the things we want, hope, need, expect, you'll guide us in. But God, so often we get that order mixed up. We put ourselves first, we put our career first, we put uh, something <laughs> in front of you. And when we do that, everything gets out of balance. So I pray God that your blessing on each of us today, that you'll continue to guide and lead and direct us. For it's in your name we pray, amen. Bless you, have a great day. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. 
That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.